This is Epicenter, episode 404, with guest Chris Badafora. Welcome to Epicenter, the podcast where, where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. I'm Friederike Ernst, and I'm here with Sunny Agrawal. Today, we're speaking with Chris Badafora, who is um, the founder of BadgerDAO. BadgerDAO brings Bitcoin to DeFi in all sorts of ways. We'll, we'll talk about this with Chris in a little bit. But uh, first, let um, us tell you about our sponsor this week. Dexes, they're great, but they're vulnerable to a lot of problems like MEV, and MEV is not fun. Uh, and you also get a lot sort of failed transactions, high gas costs. So there's a cool protocol called CowSwap, which tackles a lot of these issues head on and offers a new type of trading experience. It's built by the Gnosis uh, team. It's basically a meta DEX aggregator. And so what that means is it actually aggregates over other aggregators. So, you know, now if it's too much work about thinking of whether, you know, do I go to one inch or do I go to a Paraswap or I go to Matcha? Well, CowSwap is able to aggregate over multiple of these aggregators itself. Obviously, uh, and Federica is here, and you know one of the co-hosts. So, so Federica, what well, tell us what's new about uh, CowSwap this you know recently? Yeah, so basically, we hit two hundred million trading volume this week, and uh, have more than seven thousand distinct traders at this point in time. There is also um, a public discussion going on um, around the launch of a new token for Gnosis Protocol. So basically, go to the Gnosis forum if you want to partake in that. There was a Discord la launch for CowSwap. Um, so, um, it's, and I promise it's not just memes. Actually, people talk about MEV and stuff for real. And um, there are public um, testing sessions of new features on Discord. And um, if you join, you'll get a Pope. Do I get a Pope op for every trade I do? Or, or like, do I get one Pope op or? You only if you, if you go, if you join the public test and testing session uh, on Discord. Uh. So you don't you don't get it for trading. For trading, you just get the best prices. I see. I, I feel like I should earn an NFT for every single trade I do, and it's just like so I can memorialize every. I, I want an NFT for every transaction I ever make on Ethereum. That's what I'd like to see. I I think basically if if the token um goes through, you will probably get a token. So I think that that'll be that not quite an NFT, <laughs> but you know, that may be good enough. Cool. Cool. So um, let's go back to. Badger Dao. So, Chris, tell us a bit about yourself and uh, what brought you to this space, and what what, uh, what moved you to actually start Badger Dao and you know try to bring Bitcoin to DeFi. Sure. Hey guys, uh, thanks for having me. So my story, you know, I've been in this space quite a few years, um, almost year twenty twenty, almost nine years actually, um, when I purchased my first Bitcoin. I was actually in New York at the time, and um, my office just so happened to be right below the Bitcoin Center. And a friend from college um, was like, "Hey, we got to go, you know, check out this new thing, Bitcoin." And and they were doing uh, live auctions with a gentleman with a bow tie and an Excel spreadsheet on the wall behind. Um, and everyone brought their, you know, rigged up miners and stuff. It was pretty funny. Was this the Bitcoin Center on Wall Street? That was oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, I remember that long time ago. And, you know, that that's really just piqued my interest. But I, I've always been a believer in, you know, just people owning their life and taking control for, you know, how they live their life and why, rather than, you know, taking societal societal standards and, and making those just how you live your life because that's how you're supposed to live your life, right? So I've always just believed in um, people taking freedom that way and owning their freedom. So that's what obviously attracted me to Bitcoin. And then over the years, I, I continued to, you know, invest and you know, be part of Bitcoin talk forum and things along those lines. And then, you know, being from Toronto, when Ethereum launched, that was kind of when um, a lot of light bulbs were going off in my mind. And I started seeing the potential for what was going to what was going to come. And that's where I decided um, to stop doing what I was doing, which was primarily in e-commerce and digital marketing and sales and things along those lines and um, invest my time uh, full time in crypto. And I started helping a few projects with those specific things, right? You know, digital marketing and so forth, um, continue to invest in different projects. And then, you know, as the years went on, 
got involved in a variety of different things, helped doing um, some crypto community events, like, you know, helped do uh, San Francisco Blockchain Week in 2018, um, you know, with, uh, with the, the Norris crew and, and a few folks. And, and, um, and primarily just uh, was uh, consulting for different crypto projects until the um, middle class, close to end of 2019. And uh, that's for, that's where for me it was, um, you know, I wanted to have a bigger impact on the space that I grew to love, and have an impact that lasted a really long time. Um, and I wanted to be a builder, right? That's really you know what I wanted to do. And I and I believed in um, the power of Bitcoin and Bitcoin being used in financial applications um, and being accelerated by you know blockchains like Ethereum, obviously. Um, and potentially a variety of others, but um, that that's where the journey started. And you know, going back to this idea of freedom, I also have never been a big fan of you know centralized corporations and just hierarchical decisions, and you know all the lack of transparency on a day to day. And you know, you start combining those things and and the acceleration of um, decentralized organizations in the in the beginning of 2020, and actually seeing real value and real you know assets. Um, inside of these decentralized orgs, that's where you know this is called the, the start started line in my head, and um, decided to push forward with creating a decentralized organization that was really had one core focus, and that was to build the infrastructure to bring Bitcoin to uh, decentralized finance. So, how did the team meet, or was there a core team? And uh, how, how did you how did you get more people pulled in to decentralize it? It's pretty wild. I, I still can't believe how some of this stuff came together, but um, it was me and two other folks, one uh, lead Solidity developer and one lead uh, front end and, and UX. And I pretty much handled, you know, the business development, the marketing, um, token structure, things along those lines. And uh, we brought it to market December 3rd. And the way that we brought it to market, we didn't raise any money. We self-funded it. Um, and we wanted to launch with a product that people wanted to use. So our, you know, we launched with our first product, which are our set vaults where people can deposit tokenized Bitcoin and earn interest on it in a non-custodial way. Um, and it was through that leading up to that launch, um, we launched our Discord in September and we had a program that we called the Early Contributor Program, right? So, you know, we came up with a bunch of wild stuff and we essentially took all those ideas from like the token breakdown to how the products are going to work to everything. And we just spewed it on this discord and all these different channels and uh, people just started joining people started joining through word of mouth people started joining just through other protocols sharing that they're excited about our launch upcoming launch and um and then the early contributor program was that kind of incentive where people with aligned values wanted to help wanted to help figure some of these things out and and that's exactly what they did right months in advance i call it day zero type stuff um, there was over 100 people that were rewarded as part of the early contributor program. And, and these people, just not knowing that Badger would be anything, um, you know, just wanted to help from everything from design to development to um, economic, you know, economic uh, decisions around the token structure and liquidity mining program and a variety of things. And, um, and then that just started snowballing. Um, and from that point on, Every day we'd have new contributors that wanted to help and some people that helped a bit and then kind of left and then some people that helped a bit and then helped a lot and then stuck around. And, you know, now there's almost 20 people that work um, full time every day on the Badger protocol and um, a community of, you know, 15,000 people that are avidly excited about what's coming next and adding value and helping and um, and just being a part of it. Right. And, and it's been just interesting for us because, you know, There's no bank accounts, there's no legal entities, there's none of these things. So you have to attract certain types of people. And it's not like, you know, we can put a job post out and say, hey, come on, you know, join. And you know, that that really, we've never done that. We've never done a job post. We've never done anything like that. It's just all been um, people from the community getting involved and just having, uh, again, that, that shared vision for what could be if we were able to actually accomplish this thing. As someone who's been um, in this ecosystem a long time and whose background is in business development and in marketing and so on, what I mean, what we actually see is that there are these communities that are basically 
their grassroots and they kind of they emerge and they are self-sustaining and so on. Um, and then there are communities that never really take off, right? So basically there are, there are communities where there's lot, lots of push and uh, money and everything behind it, but still for some reason they fail to actually garner that critical mass and in a way they're dead on arrival. Um, what what do you attribute that to? I mean, basically, Badger Dow was super successful in in how it took off off from from nothing and how dynamic and big the community is. What do you think are the contributing factors? Well, there are a few. I think the the main one is uh, having shared values, a shared value and belief system. Like everyone in our community believes um, that Bitcoin is going to be, and, and when I use the term Bitcoin, I don't, I don't necessarily just mean native Bitcoin on the Bitcoin network. I mean, tokenized Bitcoin, wrapped Bitcoin, really uh, a representation of Bitcoin is going to be a paramount, um, a critical asset to decentralized finance infrastructure and, and the future of decentralized finance, really what we're all building. And, and that shared belief in Bitcoin as that um, leading horse is really what brings everyone together. And, and I think another key piece is how you identify the right people to even kickstart that community, right? So for us, what we did as part of our launch is we looked at 32,000 wallets for two years prior to our launch and identified 19 different actions, things that, that we believe, you know, aligned with our values. So for example, anyone that participated in um, on-chain voting with Yearn or Sushi or even off-chain through Snapshot, Yearn, Sushi, Harvest, uh, OneHive, things along those lines, or people that use tokenized Bitcoin on Aave or Compound or provided liquidity on Balancer or Sushi or Uniswap or, or whatever it may be. Um, and, and the, you know, it was those types of actions that really aligned the people that we believed would be the right community members to really take this and, and lead it. And, um, and, and those, those are the types of things that we identified early. And when we identified those, we also built a product that we felt those same people would want to use day one. And then by saying, hey, you share in our values, you're there from day one. It's not like you're coming day 40 after, you know, venture capitalists and a bunch of, a bunch of different groups kind of facilitated a certain start. No, you're, you're there from, you know, day zero, the ups and the downs. And you now have a product that you've been looking to use. We thought at least people would want to use something like this and it turned out they did. And then by the way, you have the ability to decide all the factors and the direction of said app and whatever, you know, the protocol ends up becoming and the value that it ends up um, incurring. So you know, those were those are some of the critical things that um, that we did early on that I think most aligned our community and, and made them really a strong force. And and I think as well, another big thing was, you know, when you look at those actions, like another key action that we looked at was anyone that uh, donated to Gitcoin uh, for the first seven rounds at the time, um, and we were the first ones to you know airdrop to people that participated in Gitcoin and work with the team to. Um, help that, uh, help gather that information. But also we carved off 2% of our supply to Gitcoin, right from like, right from the beginning. And this was something that was decided as part of the early contributors. And again, these are the types of things that those actions align certain types of individuals. And um, with those types of individuals, if you actually want to build something that's led and run by a community, you better hope that you have some really good community members with the, the right skill set and mindset to take this where it needs to go. Because it's not about, you know, me or the other few people that started it. It all becomes about the people that, that lead it moving forward to which like I'm just, you know, I, I consider myself just another um, contributor to the, to the organization. So, you know, you mentioned that like um, sort of the guiding flag right now of a lot of the Badger community is this, uh, you know, Bitcoin on DeFi. What is it about like Bitcoin? and DeFi together that like excites you so much? Well, you know, Bitcoin, in my opinion, I get some flat for it, but I, I feel like it's the best um, money ever invented. And it also, and just from a pure, um, 
you know, facts perspective, right? It represents 50% of the entire cryptocurrency market cap, um, the highest number of wallet addresses in the world. Um, and, and obviously, you know, the, the amount of years that it has behind it since launch and, you know, organic growth and things along those lines, that in my opinion, it becomes that asset that everyone wants to use when they want to um, use a financial application. And, you know, the, the proof was really in the pudding in the last year and a half, right? I think in the beginning of 2020, there was a thousand Bitcoins that were bridged to other chains. Um, I think now there's like 290,000 or, or little more than 1% of the entire Bitcoin supply uh, that's, that's been bridged to other chains and tokenized or wrapped in, in some form or fashion. And if you look at like what's happened during that time, you know, it's been the explosion of um, DeFi dApps. And it's really those apps and the ability to earn on it, lend it, borrow against it, a variety of things while still being able to control your assets um, and see exactly what's happening with your Bitcoin almost to the second that it makes it that attractive. And if you if you rewind and look at, you know, some of the use cases for Bitcoin, um, which uh, admittedly there hasn't been much um, uh, over the years, you know, one of the things that picked up quite a bit was uh, centralized lenders. I think, you know, uh, Genesis Trading just came out with their Q2 report um, and the numbers are just staggering, like billions and billions and billions of dollars worth of lending and borrowing with Bitcoin being the primary asset that's being used for these types of things. Um, and not pointing at Genesis or anyone, but just in general, you know, you, you give up control of your assets and you don't have the ability to see what's actually happening with your Bitcoin. And that's a big, 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 big problem. And it goes directly against the, the whole ethos of Bitcoin. And I don't think that's going to be able to last for that long before the people want to be able to have that level of control and have that um, transparency. I think a hurdle that, you know, Bitcoiners, as they call them, are going to have to get over is like, how is that enabled, right? And that it's not on the Bitcoin network. I'm not saying that it, it will never be on the Bitcoin network, but uh, I think the Bitcoin network in general, uh, it, it's going to take much longer. And I don't think it's ever going to capture the type of market share that something like Ethereum has been able to capture or will capture moving forward. Uh, so, that, you know, that's that's why I think Bitcoin is going to be one of the biggest assets and most used assets in all of DeFi. Obviously, Ethereum and obviously stable coins um, are up in that up in that bucket as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I completely agree with you. I mean, I, someone a couple of weeks ago described me as the most Bitcoin maxi shitcoiner they know, which is I'm like, I'll take that as a compliment. Yeah, you know, I definitely agree with you that, like, you know, I think I, I am also, you know, I think Bitcoin is probably the best asset that exists in all of crypto right now. And, you know, so there's this, I, you know, there's also like what I like to say is like everyone in crypto is a Bitcoiner, right? Like I bet I, I it'll be very hard to find anyone who is not like, you know, doesn't have Bitcoin. But is Badger sort of who is the target audience right now? Is it these people who are already into DeFi and are like, you know, uh, you know, I already did DeFi with my ETH and USDC and it's like, oh, but I also have, you know, a third to half of my portfolio in Bitcoin. Let me bring that and use that in DeFi as well. Or are you actually going to like, you know, this larger Bitcoin community that's outside of DeFi right now and trying to bring them uh, into DeFi? Well, it's it's the former right now, right? So right now, um, the majority of the people that use our applications and products are those that are already comfortable with tokenized or wrapped versions of Bitcoin, already comfortable using applications on Ethereum, um, and are already comfortable um, participating in decentralized finance. That's where our, our main target audience has been. Um, in the last three months, we've worked hard to try and bring more Bitcoin uh, into, the, into DeFi, essentially. And I feel like we've done a decent job. Um, we launched our bridge product in partnership with Ren. Uh, VM that allows anyone to take Bitcoin and deposit it right into our vaults to earn interest. And we've had over $245 million worth of native Bitcoin um, that's gone through our bridge during that time. So yeah, I'm, I'm pretty proud of being able to accomplish that. But for the most part, Sunny, right now, it's about, uh, super, you know, let's call them power DeFi users and, you know, wanting to get the best um, return on their Bitcoin and in and, and the most trusted way, because we know 
how uh, notoriously untrustworthy certain applications and new launches and things like that um, are, are happening at this point in the market. So, you know, having a place where they can trust uh, and, and then, of course, get the best return. But to speak to like where we want to go, which is this idea of anyone that is thinking about holding Bitcoin or holds native Bitcoin and wants to do more with it. Um, and literally in a couple clicks, in 10 seconds, they're able to earn on it. That's where we want to go. And we believe that, you know, this maxi crowd is just a small, 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 um, you know, bucket in, in the entire pool. And, you know, the pool is not going to care as much about, oh, we're actually bridging that Bitcoin to Ethereum, right? They're not going to care about that. The fact that they still have a bill, you know, total control around their assets and, and, and full transparency, I think, is what they're going to want. And uh, with us, and, you know, some are the same as us, some are different. But then to then have a say in the app that you use every day, it's like me going up to Robinhood and being like, hey, your fees suck. I'm going to call 10 other friends on Robin Hood and, and we're going to put a proposal together to change the fees. Like that would never happen. Um, so I think that is how the mass market's going to start, you know, consuming us and, and a variety of other protocols. Um, but really with our push towards, uh, you know, a product that we launched, I think about uh, four months ago called or two months ago called interest bearing Bitcoin. Uh, we hope for that to be the quickest and easiest way for anyone to start earning interest on their Bitcoin simply by just by swapping um, Bitcoin for it. And then at any time they can redeem for more underlying Bitcoin, at, you know, anywhere between four and five percent APY and all done completely, you know, by smart contracts, not by any type of, you know, lending and borrowing and, you know, OTC desk or anything like that. So. Let's uh, get into some of the products like, so, you know, the Badger DAO is this community that's building sort of a set of different products. Uh, before we start to deep dive into any specific one, let's just like get a, give a layout of what are the products. So, so far, you know, I, met, I know you, there's like two, there's like the dig product and then there's the set product. And then I, you just mentioned the Bitcoin, the, the, the Badger bridge. Um, are there any other main like product verticals? Or um, are those sort of the three main ones? Yeah, we actually have four. So, uh, you know, the foundation of Badger is really what we call our set vaults. And this is, you know, smart contracts that optimize yield for users, you know, often called yield, yield aggregators, uh, but focus exclusively on tokenized Bitcoin. Uh, we then have our Bitcoin bridge, which enables anyone to bring Bitcoin and start earning on it immediately. We have interest bearing Bitcoin. Uh, which is backed one to one by any interest bearing vault positions in our set vaults, and then finally we have Dig, which is a re the first rebasing Bitcoin um, that was uh, that was brought to market, inspired by Ampleforth. So, which one do you think we should start with? I think the set vaults make the most sense. Again, they're they're the, they're the nucleus, as I call them. They're by far, um, you know, our core product. Yeah, can can you maybe just give us an overview of uh, what uh, the the set does? We have a bunch of different vaults, about fifteen different vaults, and users can choose which vault to deposit into. Each vault um, has a different strategy for how it generates a yield, and in most instances, each vault has a different asset that's accepted in that vault. As an example. You might bring WBTC to our WBTC vault that we built in partnership with Yearn, and that has you know a set of strategies that it runs to optimize um, the yield that users get. You might bring TBTC um, by the Keep team uh, and the Curve LP token associated with that, and deposit that into our vaults um, and earn you know a specific return. I think it's you know it's fifteen or sixteen percent while at the same time uh, running unique strategy different from the WBTC vault, for example. And then the list really, really goes on. There's a whole bunch. There's different LP positions like WBTC ETH pairs. There's um, obviously Badger you can deposit, DIG you can deposit, interest bearing Bitcoin you can deposit, all the different flavors of Bitcoin, SBTC, PBTC, OBTC, WBTC, RMBTC, um, just, just a whole slew of uh, different ways to earn on um, earn on your Bitcoin. And really uh, what we've developed are, you know, smart contracts that take those assets and do things for you that tend to be resource intensive, expensive from a gas perspective and time consuming. 
And instead of you doing it, as you know, I'll just give you an example. One of our uh, one of our vaults is the IBBTC WBTC um, Sushi Vault, and when you deposit an LP on Sushi, you you earn a percentage of the trading fees in that pool. If you if that pool is uh, eligible for Sushi rewards, you can then take that LP token that they gave you and stake it to earn Sushi, which is great. But you need to claim that Sushi periodically and then decide what to do with it. So we built we built a, a smart contract that automatically takes your LP position, stakes it for sushi, then takes that sushi and stakes it for X sushi, which is the protocol sharing stake position for sushi that yields anywhere between 10 and 20 percent APY. And then we distribute that X sushi to the users periodically. So we save them all that time and effort and optimize the amount of harvest and how frequently we do it to get them the best auto compounding APY. And, um, and users like to use that, you know, that vault in particular, especially if they, if they want to accumulate more sushi, um, as an example, versus, you know, other types of strategies that might be something like uh, a levered up uh, compound strategy, where we take WBTC, we lend it out, we, we, we borrow, yeah, we lend it out, we take the borrowed assets, we you know reinject it and do that loop four or five times and then manage the debt, manage the debt positions accordingly um, to generate you know a level of APY. Same thing on Aave and and, and a variety of others. So you know that's that's the beauty of DeFi is they're all Lego pieces and they're really just smart contracts and anybody at any time can just plug into those and create different types of strategies to provide some value to a user. And in the set vaults products, it's users that want to earn interest on their Bitcoin and you know really just sit back and, and let the smart contracts do the work. So who's in charge of devising the strategies? So the way that we um, we built uh, our this is called our strategist bench, um, similar to how kind of Yearn started developing theirs, Wi-Fi. For us, it's like everything else, it's a community-oriented initiative. So um, anybody can become a Badger strategist, can build different strategies. And then um, as part of that, you know, our vaults have different fees. You know, we have a 20% performance fee and then a 0.5% withdrawal fee on those vaults. The strategist that develops that strategy earns up to 50% of that performance fee. And this is all... Um, obviously cemented in the in the in the con in the contracts so we you know that's that's how we develop um different strategies is we crowdsource it from the community you know early on you know our the internal developers developed many of the strategies in the beginning and then you know every month we subsequently get more and more uh folks interested in building with us and uh and that's how we develop different types of strategies are they audited for economic viability and smart contract risk? Most certainly, yeah. We, we've done that from the start. And, and one thing I'll just point out is like audits are audits, right? Like call it what it is. Um, you know, just a few days ago, there was a protocol that was exploited for 21 million that had like three audits or something, right? Like it's, it's a must and they're, they're a set of smart eyes. We obviously believe in it. We audit everything we do. Um, but we have a variety of other measures. So even before we launched, we ensured that our protocol was audited. And then as we started growing up, uh, we started implementing a few other things. So we have a smart contract advisory board. And this board is a, a group of um, you know, really, really high, high quality developers within the DeFi ecosystem, many that are part of other protocols and that um, you know, review early iterations of our code. And we bring anything that we do through the smart contract advisory board, even before audit. We then work with uh, an auditing, multiple auditing firms, but a, you know, a, a primary auditing firm on a monthly basis that audits all of our contracts. We then have a level of peer review amongst a lot of the different protocols that we work with. Um, and then finally, um, we try and protect users as much as possible by having guarded launches. So for guarded launches, what we do is we limit the amount per wallet that can deposit in the new vaults and we cap the total amount that that vault can take in. And then we also whitelist users um, based on, you know, different activities that they've done within the Badger ecosystem. We call it a Badger score. And, you know, only certain folks can meet certain, um, can participate in certain guarded launches based on their uh, Badger score. It might be, hey, they provided liquidity or they voted in governance or they've been part of Badger for X amount of months or, or whatever it may be. 
an accredited badger. Yeah, yeah, we've got loyal badgers, accredited badger, a variety of things. But um, we we have we have multiple weeks of a guarded launch, and we kind of move it up. Like it starts very small, then after a week, we move it up further, and move it up further, and move it up further, and then we open it up to everyone once we feel comfortable um, with the results. You know, over that time frame. And so, what is like the difference between like you know, let's say I have WBTC. Why would I put it in the badger or badger vault instead of going to a urine vault? Like, is there any? Um, is it literally just competing on strategies, or is there some other big differentiator between? Why 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 go to a Bitcoin focus aggregator instead of a more generalized one like urine? Well, we work closely with Yearn, um, um, and we're and we partner on a lot of things, including the WBTC vault that you would deposit on Yearn. So there's <laughs> very uh, and you would deposit into Badger, it, it goes through the Yearn Vault as well. Um, but really, when you look at other ag- aggregators, not necessarily Yearn in particular, but uh, there's, a, there's a variety of things. Um, first and foremost is just how the whole system works together. So, you know, we have a few different mechanics in place, but we believe that when people deposit in a variety of different vaults, they're potentially going to want liquidity out of those assets, and they're going to want to continue to earn interest while being able to put those those um, deposits to work. It's not, you know, it's not an ideal uh, experience to just kind of deposit here and that's it. So that's why we created an interest bearing Bitcoin and it really allows anyone in all of, you can be in 10 vaults and you can consolidate those vault positions into, you know, it's, it's backed by a basket of those vaults, but it's pretty much a, a meta uh, token. And then you can go and take that and bring it to cream and, and um, borrow against it or provide, LP on Sushi to earn additional APY or bridge it to Solana and earn over there or bridge it to Polygon and deposit it into a variety of different protocols. So that's one of the things that we do that that most others don't is, you know, having the liquidity in your position. I think as well, um, we've been relatively innovative around different type of mechanics to uh, incentivize certain actions in the app or boost rewards. So we introduced something called Badger Boost. And what Badger Boost is, is if a user has Bitcoin deposited in the app, we look at what their stake ratio is. Stake ratio is the Badger balance, the US dollar representation of your Badger balance, plus a US dollar representation of your DIG balance, another Badger asset, um, divided by the dollar value of your Bitcoin deposits. The higher the stake ratio, the higher the multiplier on additional rewards you get when depositing in our app. And why that's important is because it encourages the type of behavior that um, best benefits the DAO, which is people that are not just using Bitcoin to earn and then taking some of the additional rewards and then you know selling them off explicitly, but instead people that are holding those rewards, but more importantly, participating. Um, and getting involved in what what the the app and and the organization needs to move forward, and so th- you know so those are certain things that that we do um, that others don't. And then I think another big uh, another big you know feather on our cap is just our laser focus from a security perspective. Like from day one, you know that uh, that's been our absolute focus, and it's going to continue to be our focus. And you know we move. Some people think we move fast, in our mind we move a little slow, just so we can make sure like as much as as much as in in the the development team's control, we can mitigate risk um, in you know building some of these new tools that that really haven't existed before. What's the amount of Bitcoin currently under management um, with Badger? About six hundred million dollars, and then a few months ago, it there was a peak of about two point five billion. That's when Bitcoin was was much higher uh, in price, but uh, neither here nor there. Um, those in the in the earlier days, we had up to two point five billion in um, in Bitcoin deposit in the app. Oh wow, that's uh, that's a big number. <laughs> Lots of Bitcoin. Well, one thing I want to talk about actually as well, though, is like so. What level of um, control does like the Badger token hat holders have over this? Like you know, because let's say the Badger, um, if I remember correctly, the current market cap is around. 150 million or something and so if the big value of the bitcoin is in in the 600 million like 
how do you think about like dealing thinking about the security model around this yeah so there's been there's been a whole slew of um you know we call them badger token v2 conversations amongst the community around um you know having different models security models and backstops things similar to ave and and looking at different things like redemption pools and uh, a variety of other things uh, but for the most part today the badger token governs um, the parameters of all of our products it governs the treasury um, and 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 that's really you know and and obviously it governs really any economic decision that um, the organization could make and and you know to be honest with you some people kind of say hey like well you you you're just governing you know uh, this protocol like what does that mean well it, it's it's not it's they're not small numbers like you know you know in our treasury we have like 50 million dollars of bitcoin and stable coin and you know we have to put that to work we have to use that accordingly there's a variety of decisions that go into how that capital is managed our total treasury when you look at badger that's in there too and dig it's like over 150 million dollars um, so it's not by any means a small number, and there's a lot of critical decisions that need to go into how that treasury is managed. And then more importantly, the app, right? We've had 60, 66 different uh, improvement proposals pass through governance. Um, we've had 65 that have passed and, 60, and one that have, one has failed during that time frame. Um, and we have arguably, you know, one of the most active voting communities, um, you know, based on, you know, different types of... Uh, um, statistics from Deep DAO and a variety of other, um, uh, even even you know snapshot themselves, um, but neither here nor there. That's how, that's what the Badger token governs uh, today. Uh, but moving forward, you know the intention of the community and you know different people that are working on Badger every day is to really build a more robust, um, uh, more robust use case for Badger around you know securing the protocol, the applications, um, token holder value. And, and I think a delicate thing here is, you know, revenue, um, revenue share. And I know, you know, quite a few protocols have accelerated even at launch to have the ability for users to earn a percentage of whatever the protocol makes. I'm not saying I'm against that because I'm not, but it's definitely something, you know, we were very conscious to not do, um, trying to be as delicate from a regulatory perspective as possible. But I know it's something that a lot of people are looking at potentially implementing or, or that or want to implement because, you know, it is, it, again, it's pretty substantial numbers, you know, over 25 million in revenue in seven months. Um, that's, that's quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of money that could go back to token holders potentially. Can you talk about how governance has changed from the get go? So I, I remember like a couple of years ago, um, I quipped that most DAOs are just three white guys with a multi-sig. And basically, obviously, that has changed in the ecosystem quite a bit. But very few DAOs have actually achieved full decentralization. I mean, wh where's where's Badger DAO on that scale? Well, Badger DAO is closer to the beginning of that scale um, with a path towards decentralization. It's been a really interesting journey you know, I'll just speak for myself in trying in, in the delicate balance that comes with trying to decentralize while still trying to remain agile and, and protect um, users and users funds when you're putting, you know, smart contracts to the market that touch hundreds of millions of dollars in days, right? Like in this environment, it's very different from what it was a few years ago where you, know, you put a smart con you deploy a smart contract, you open it up and it gets like, you know, five hundred grand in like a few months. I think we've launched products that have gotten five hundred million in two days, new contracts. Like, you know, naturally you want smart contracts to be battle tested with a lot of time in market before you start removing certain functionality like upgradability or, you know, proxy control or, or things along those lines. Um you know, so for us, where we sit today is we sit closer to the beginning where we have uh, multi-sig governance that's dictated by the token holders. Um, our contracts are upgradable. Um, they are behind a 40, every, you know, all our major contracts, all of our contracts are behind a 48-hour time lock. 
um, which gives additional security to users to ensure that, you know, different rogue developers couldn't you know, put a change forward. Users would always have 48 hours before that change uh, gets implemented. Um, you know, but our goal, our hundred percent, is to try and decentralize as much as humanly possible, um, while taking it a little slower for the purpose of ensuring that you know our contracts are ready, and um, and the user and the user funds and the ability to respond in case of an emergency, uh, that speed is still there and adequate. So you know, there's been quite a few discussions, what we call roadmap to decentralizations proposed. And being worked on within the community, you know, and over the course of the next six to twelve months, I hope we make, you know, the intentions to make quite a bit of progress towards that. So then, back to the uh, product. So you mentioned the uh, interest-bearing Bitcoin as a separate product. If I understand it correctly, though, would would inter would the interest-bearing Bitcoin would it be as simple as thinking of it as is it just your tokenized position in the set vaults, or is it actually more com something more complicated than that? Yeah, it's it's more complicated because it's a basket of your tokenized positions in the vaults and it averages out the underlying interest earned through your tokenized positions in this basket. Would it be fair to call it an aggregator over the Badger set vaults? Most certainly, but it's not just in it's not just for Badger set vaults. It is today. Um, but something like AWBTC from Aave or CWBTC from Compound can easily be included. Now, inherently, they have lower interest rates, so that would be something that the community would want to vote in um, and it potentially bring the, under, the overall underlying down. Um, but you know, neither here nor there, you know, interest-bearing Bitcoin is backed with um, tokenized vault positions, which in turn are essentially just smart contracts taking optimized yield positions on Bitcoin. Um, and, then, and and I know there's also this other thing called clause as well. Is that related or is that something different? Yeah, clause was an initial product uh, that we started working on um, near the beginning of our journey. And the idea of that was a, a Bitcoin collateralized stable coin. And, you know, over time, you know, with certain limitations around how we would bring that to market and the market conditions, you know, some of the developers decided to you know, put that on the, the back burner for now. So really, you know, the focus then became um, really around interest bearing Bitcoin and how do you bring that to market? But more importantly, like we look at it as a product that um, is the most, you know, the most liquid Bitcoin on every chain, right? Like you, today you go, you know, to Solana, there's, you know, wormhole WBTC and REN WBTC, and then you go to um, Polygon or BSC and it's BTCB and, you know, a variety of different things. Um, but if there's one Bitcoin consistent that you can bring to any chain and it's inherently earning interest, you know, we think there's yeah. a, a space for that to really accelerate in the market. And, and, if, and, it, and it really bleeds back into our vault product because essentially any, any IBBTC that's minted, it's almost like locked Bitcoin inside of our vaults, uh, which is really important since, you know, the, the app earns uh, revenue based on um, the performance fees on those specific vault positions. And then, you know, that eventually we hope it to become, you know, that the easiest place to earn on your Bitcoin, because any, you know, centralized platform, anyone that's looking to offer yield to their users, they can go out like most have done to date, um, where they built like a lending and borrowing desk, and they need to have people and contracts and quantify lending and borrowing Bitcoin to be able to offer a yield on BTC to their retail users, um, if they have an app or whatever it may be, to just integrating interest-bearing Bitcoin and users can easily swap from native BTC right into it and be earning on that and redeem for it at any time and see exactly where, um, how the Bitcoin is being put to work. So we, we see that as, you know, the, the future of really how the narrative of bringing Bitcoin to DeFi is going to uh, land with the mass market. And we think, you know, through different integrators, that's going to be one of the ways that we're able to do that. I guess then the, you know, let's go on to uh, the dig side of things. So the set protocol is, or, and all the associated products around it seem, you know, they have this like, you know, they all intertwine. We see how the interest bearing Bitcoin are kind of dependent on the set and all that. But then there's this like separate universe of this like dig product. So, you know, can you maybe just 
talk to us a little bit about tell us a little bit about what that is and then how it maybe does relate to the rest of the Badger universe. Yeah, most certainly. So you're, you're spot on. Like the bridge and the vaults and IBBTC are constantly working together. You can bring Bitcoin, native Bitcoin, through the bridge right into the vaults. You can then mint IBBTC and then use it wherever you want to use it. Dig was actually our second product after the vaults um, that we launched before the bridge and IBBTC. And, um, you know, it, it really falls into this like bucket that we'll call like synthetics, synthetic Bitcoin alternatives. And we felt that there was room for, at a protocol level, being able to create uh, resemble Bitcoin and do it in a non-custodial way. And, and we were inspired by the rebasing mechanics um, from Ampleforth, if you're familiar, which essentially means baked into the token contract. If the uh, price on a given day, if the price of that asset, in this case, DIG, is above the price of Bitcoin, then more DIG would be in your wallet than the day before based on, you know, a 10, a 10 day roll in average. So, for example, if it's 10 percent higher than the price of Bitcoin today, there will be 1 percent more DIG in your wallet. Why? Because they then, the protocol then wants you to sell that dig because now you have more of it. And that naturally should bring the price closer to the equilibrium zone, which is in, you know, 5% of the price of the underlying asset uh, that you're rebasing against. And then vice versa on the, on the buy side, or excuse me, on the, um, on the lower price. If it's a negative rebase or it's lower than the price of Bitcoin, you actually um, have less dig in your wallet, which encourages people to buy to to bring them back to the position. And some people look at it as an opportunity to hedge against, you know, Bitcoin over a couple week period and a variety of things. But at the core of it, you know, we felt and we continue to feel there's room in the market for non-custodial synthetic Bitcoins and these Bitcoins that use different types of mechanics like rebasing to accomplish that. Why rebasing? So. You know, I've actually spent a lot of time thinking about rebasing systems. You know, I have this, like, I'm trying to put together this, like, taxonomy of synthetic designs. And in my taxonomy, I call rebasing the poor van synthetics. Because it's like, it's like you know, it, it's kind of a synthetic, but it's, it's, it's really, honestly, this, like, sort of weird asset class that I don't think has, like, has a good analogy outside of, like, crypto already. What are people using this dig thing for? Because, like, yes, I understand the price of dig will always keep rebasing, but like, the value in someone's wallet is is not really tracking the price of Bitcoin because you know just because if, if things are rebasing, you know I, what I care about is how much is the value in my wallet going up and down. And so, are people holding this as a way of getting exposure to? Bitcoin, or are they using it in some other way? It's the latter um, right now. You know, with these types of mechanics, which, you know, I would argue are very experimental, and we've seen that firsthand from massive positive rebases that extended for months to, you know, triple the supply to um, going the other way and reducing the supply, you know, 80, 90%. So people today use it really for opportunities to increase, um, you know, value in their portfolio. How do they increase value? They look at the market cap, right? So if, if you're looking at the price that in many instances, people would suggest that's the wrong way of looking at a rebasing asset, because if it, if the underlying value of the asset that's rebasing against, like an ample fourth case is the U is, is $1, for example, it, it ideally should never be five, ten, twenty, thirty dollars, right? It should really never be that. But if it's in a few points, you know, ten percent of of one dollar, it's one dollar and ten cents, and whatever it may be, the market capitalization of it's going to keep growing because there's going to be more and more in circulation. So if something's a dollar, but it's had a hundred positive rebases at one percent each, it technically now should have double the market cap of what it had before. And even at the same price, you know, that speculative investor would have now doubled the capital that he invested in the beginning. And that's how people use this asset for us. Um, it's very volatile, extremely volatile. It's very experimental today. And we've seen that through um, what we've been building. But our, our vision was always, you know, 
one being first, but also ensuring utility. Because a lot of rebasing assets don't have utility. And if you can find a way to drive relative stability on that asset, but more importantly, you have a bunch of different use cases for it, which inherently bring more stability to it, since people be depositing it to borrow against it in a variety of different things, you know, that over time, especially in this early, early market of DeFi and like the primitives that are being built now, there's something to be said around, you know, when something's been around a long time and has a bunch of places that you can use it. Um, and, you know, obviously has some of the other mechanics that people might be interested in. So we've, we've tried hard to find additional, we call them like third party anchors for DIG because we, we've, um, we've seen how the buy side is not nearly as effective as the sell side, like from a token mechanic perspective, we're on the sell side, everyone's going to, you know, a lot of people sell when it goes above, but when it's below people get scared and, and sell instead of buy and, and get back in their position. Um, so we've introduced a variety of things. One of the things that's worked really well in the last couple of months, at least is, um, our, uh, KPI options in partnership with UMA, where we instead of saying, hey, deposit dig into our vaults to earn, you know, certain rewards, we say those rewards are only paid out if certain actions are met. For example, um, at a minimum five rebase positive rebases in a 30 day time frame for every additional positive rebase after five, you incrementally get more rewards. Um, as part of that. So that additional uh, anchor or factor just just further nudges users to do, you know, what the, the underlying token mechanics needed to do to grow a market cap, essentially. I mean, and following, you know, uh, Ample for there was like, you know, a series of, you know, rebase 2.0 projects that came out, you know, you got Yam, but then, you know, I think maybe the biggest one was ESD. Uh, and, you know, they had something interesting going on where they actually, like, took what I would consider a somewhat silly mechanism of rebasing and then actually kind of try to apply it in a more useful, productive way. Have you, have you guys been working, thinking about any of sort of these kind of things, how we, how, how to make, you know, take this dig and maybe, for, for, I guess part of it is how, do, how does, so how does it connect back to that rest of the Badger ecosystem? Does it feed back into Badger value or in any way? Yeah, so so right now, um, Dig is used as part of Badger Boost. So the dollar value of Dig that you hold or stake will increase your underlying APY when depositing Bitcoin in the app. So that's its main utility today. Um, but we've we've worked with the stabilized team to create what we call a stability vault. Uh, so this is really how it ties back into our existing products. Um, and this vault, essentially, what it does is based on parameters automatically. Um, buys and sells at certain certain times. Um, and if we could have a, a larger percentage of that circulating supply deposited in that vault, that vault is really going to help prevent DIG from getting below a certain price and also going above a certain price. But what's happening there is you're inherently building um, a WBTC reserve. So you're almost having it um, being backed partially by WBTC but doing it in a way where instead of just taking, you know, WBTC and, you know, just uh, putting it against it, um, instead, you know, we use, you know, these automated strategies to create that reserve and then help um, drive those, um, help drive those parameters as necessary to, to keep it in a certain range. So, that, you know, that's, again, this is what we've been trying, um, you know, uh, doubt, you know, admittedly, it's not, it's not easy like this. You know, tackling rebasing is very, very difficult. Um, we, like many, have had challenges with it, uh, but we, of course, continue to stay committed to try and make it um, as successful as we can. I'm excited from it from the perspective of that, like, I think what we've seen in the last, like, one year is so many new stablecoin designs, right? Really, I treat stablecoins as a very specialized type of synthetic. They're a USD synthetic. And... A lot of these designs, so you know, maybe USD is the most demanded synthetic in 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 DeFi. But I, I'm willing to bet that maybe a Bitcoin synthetic might be the second most like demanded synthetic, and so or an interest bearing Bitcoin synthetic. But but what I'm saying is that's still backed by like wrapped Bitcoin. But I, I'm talking about like a you know some sort of, you know how Dig is 
kind of trying to be like a a no collateralized like uh synthetic bitcoin and so like you know you look at something like you know i'm a big fan of Faye protocol right and so that's like a protocol that like it's a new stable coin design that's like partially collateralized and so i wonder if there's a ways to take like the idea behind the Faye stable coin and turn it into take that same mechanism design and create some, some sort of partially collateralized bitcoin or something like that so there's yeah. there's no doubt that's gonna ha- it's not about if it's a when right like 100 percent that's gonna happen i think a lot of these you know stable coin oriented mechanics are working themselves out like you talked about a few of them esd dsd you know and and some and and that you know rise and 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 burn and at the time when we were launching dig actually we were getting a lot of scrutiny being like oh using you know old mechanics and you know these coupon and bond models are way more effective and look at this and look at that and you know the, the the nature of the beast is is like these are all experiments that you know we're trying to figure out and i but i do agree with you sonny like over time um many of the interesting uh, designs for for stable coins are it's going to bleed into other assets for sure and you know and we've, we've already started to see some of those things um already um but yeah like you know i think i'm not i'm not um, that familiar with Olympus, for example, OHM, um, but I think they just recently turned it on bonding for um, ETH as an asset, and like you know, there's just there's a variety uh, of protocols, and I'm certain that you know all the top assets are going to have you know some type of representation this way. Well, unfortunately, we're getting to the end, so I have a couple of questions about the future for you. So you already kind of hinted at this, but what what are your thoughts on DeFi on Bitcoin? So things like Rootstock, for instance. Do you think that'll take off? Would you say it was stacked? Yeah, I, I think um, take off is very relative, right? You know, every day we decide what to build on. Um, and every day it makes it more and more clear that building on Ethereum is where we want to build. And, and we, we build on other chains, but primarily they're EVM compatible chains, just because it's we can just take what we've already built and port it over. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're actively, you know, preparing to launch on Optimism and Arbitrum as well and different layer two solutions. Um, so, you know, for us, at least, I'm not saying it's out of the picture. Um, DeFi on Bitcoin, I think, is a uh, very immature market uh, just because if you're actively looking at the most effective way to um, to build, it's not on Bitcoin, no matter how you slice it, even from like interoperability of tools um, and the, the, the developer audience, the every, everything you can imagine, um, it's, it's really behind the ball and it may make a lot of progress there. But like a lot of these things are super experimental anyways, like look at some of the standards in Ethereum that have been around so long and even how some of them continue. Like I think, um, you know, a white hat, uh, a white hat hacker found like, you know, a, a critical vulnerability in a contract from like four years ago or something like that, right? Like these, these are the types of things that are going to continue to come to the surface. So when you have something being built there, uh, it's going to be that much more vulnerable uh, to potential risks and ex- exploits. And I think it's important for the builders that are trying to build a new financial system to really double down on on trying their best at least to be uh, uh, act at, at a level of high integrity and at a level of high integrity in many instances when it's when everything you're building is open source is you know building where there's the least risk of um, of uh, of screwing up and, and you know putting people's funds or whatever it may be at risk so I do think I don't think it's a closed door um, I don't think necessarily it'll ever be as big as um, building on ethereum but I do think there are going to be some interesting projects that come out of it as that space matures and grows and the bridges are further developed, um, you know, there could be a place for Badger in particular to to build products there and, and provide value to users. But yeah, I, I think um I think it's quite a ways away. Yeah. And if you look at what percentage of Bitcoin is currently um wrapped and used um as collateral in DeFi, that's on the order of one percent. Um, how do you see that increasing over the coming year or two? I, I, I think it's just going to grow exponentially. I see it as, you know, 30, eventually 30, 40 percent 
of all Bitcoin will um, be wrapped and tokenized on other chains. Um, in the next year, uh, in the next two years, I'd say we'd probably hit uh, 5% if we continue growing at this pace, which I think, which I think we will. And, um, and, and really we haven't even, this is what's crazy. Like we haven't even seen, you know, big institutional money participating in DeFi applications and institutional money to me is not like Morgan Stanley and crap like that. You know, even some of the largest crypto native funds in the world that have been around four or five years that manage billions of dollars of LP money are not participating in a big way in DeFi apps, and they're not participating in a big way in DeFi. And um, that wave is just going to be crazy. And, and, and I think, um, I tend to believe, of course, if these funds and you know, crypto-native institutional players have had, uh, been around a while, there's probably a couple assets that they hold the most in, um, and those are mostly Bitcoin and Ethereum, and then obviously stable coins. They're definitely not, you know, looking to lend out shitcoin number 441 or whatever the hell it is, right? So that, that, that's where I think a lot of the um, institutional and just overall acceleration in wrapped Bitcoin, like you can already see writing on the wall with Galaxy Digital acquiring Bitco, which is uh, the, the, the custodian creator of WBTC. Um, so some of these things are just going to start accelerating much quicker than, than we anticipated. And all of a sudden we see corporate treasuries, you know, earning two or 3% on their Bitcoin and, and a variety of things happening. And that, and that number to your point is just going to, it's just going to grow like crazy. So do you think Bitcoin is going to end up as a limited supply ERC 20? Um, I don't think so. I, I think, you know, that would be suggesting that, you know, a, a lot, a lot, like 80, 90% of Bitcoin um, is tokenized and, and represented off of the Bitcoin network. I don't think that would ever happen. Um, but getting close to 50%, I wouldn't be surprised. And it's really going to come down to how, um, how Bitcoin, how the Bitcoin network can evolve. And they've always been slow, rightfully so, um, you know, from a security perspective, that's always been their mandate, slow to make changes to the underlying protocol and um, just, you know, building on the network in general. But, you know, if, if they continue to be that slow, I think it's going to be, um, I think it's going to be eventually get to the point where there's more Bitcoin off of the Bitcoin network than on the Bitcoin network. One more question for, you know, for me about Badger specifically. How important do you think like the culture and the vibes and aesthetic is to like Badger? Like you, is there, is there a sense to which the brand is the product here? And like, you know, it's bakes it such that it's like, you know, the product you know, you, you guys are iterating on a number of different products, but the real product of the Badger DAO is this idea that like, hey, I want to use Bitcoin and DeFi. That's like going to be my one stop shop to go, uh, go, go to the Badger DAO and look, you know, it'll be my dashboard. It'll be my, even in a world where let's say you removed, you know, like you mentioned, like, you know, the WBTC uh, vault in set is primarily, you know, it's mostly uh, kind of, interacting heavily with the uh yearn wbtc vaults and so is there like do you think that the, the the value really will come from being you can treat it almost like a custom skin or custom user experience that's that like wraps around all these other DeFi protocols that's really tailored towards bitcoin users yeah yeah from a product perspective sunny like i, I feel like that's where we we started our journey, right? The one-stop shop, like your your ultimate dashboard to everything Bitcoin and DeFi. That's that's changed a bit. Um, you know, where we eventually want to get to is just be the the most trusted place to earn on your Bitcoin. And we believe with you know an interest interest bearing Bitcoin type product that will kind of be our retail focus, and then all like the super users will come to like the Badger Pro app, which is more similar to what you see today. Um, and that's integrated with a variety of different protocols. There's tranching. There's in, there's all these different things you can do with synthetic assets and pick your pick which chain you want to you know go on and use the boost mechanics and all these different types of things. Um, but yeah, I, I most certainly think that you know even when we look to partner with different protocols, they always say you know in partnering with Badger, you know we're we're bringing the Bitcoin 
crowd to whatever we're working on. And, and I think that's the nature of it. Like it's really our community that's the strongest and that, you know, has this shared, you know, this shared belief system. But, you know, even, and this is really why you know, I chose the name Badger. It's because, you know, a honey badger has certain characteristics, right? They're relentless, they're fierce, they're small. They can take a, a, a bite from a rattlesnake. They can fight a tiger. That's why Bitcoin was always, that was the big, that is the Bitcoin mascot, right? Because it was always the, the little engine that could and um, something that, you know, was, was totally going against all odds. And that's, and that's how we look at it. And that's how all the community members that are fighting the same fight that, that we're fighting here and building a new financial system, rewriting the playbook on how organizations can grow and scale, but maintain a level of decentralization and transparency. And most important, bring utility to um, what we believe to be the best asset um, ever created, being Bitcoin. So it, it's a mix of a mix of a few things, Sonny. And then we have a, a direct product vision on that one click in seconds to earn um, for the masses and, and being integrated in you know every major platform that wants to offer that service to their users. And then on the flip side, you know our ethos and, and our belief system aligns very closely with with the, the Honey Badger. Cool. Thank you, Chris. So where can people find out more about uh, BadgerDAO and um, how can they partake in the experience? Well, you can come to our website, badger.finance. Um, there's a link to our app there, which is app.badger.finance. Um, I'd say the best place to start is our wiki, badger.wiki. Um, all the resources you would need around Badger, all of our products, how it all works, everything is there. And then, of course, our Discord. Our Discord is where the company and the organization, um, more importantly, the community lives and breathes. Um, so joining our Discord, there's a link on our Twitter, which is just BadgerDAO. And you can go there and, and join our Discord. And you know, there's quite a few Badgers that will welcome you with, with open hands and answer any questions that you have. And, and really just including myself and just be there to, um, to support you on your, your journey to become a Badger. Great. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Same. Thank you so much, guys. It was a great conversation. I appreciate it. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.